How did it come to this? The last few weeks things have been escalating, but I didn't think it would lead to death. What's life going to look like now? Things aren't. They can't be. The same again. These words could be said of times now. These words could be the words of Mary Magdalene as she walked towards the tomb on what we as Christians now call uh, Easter Sunday morning. We'll never know. I'm just surmising. I guess I'm looking for parallels between this, the things we're going through now and how things would have been for Mary Magdalene over that Easter weekend. And we'll look a bit deeper into that, do a bit of a, a background on Mary herself. And overall, let's see what we can pull out and what we can learn from with the suffering that Mary went through and the suffering that some of us, certainly more than others, are currently facing in this current climate and these unprecedented times. Given the current crisis we have with lockdown and social distancing, good help is hard to find. But I have managed to source the greatest theological minds Haribo can buy. Let's see how they're getting on with finding how many Marys there are in the New Testament. Okay guys, what have you got for me? Well, uh, Luke 12, 19, and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. <laughs> Seriously, a kilo of sweets, and all I get is a bad pun. I can't think where they get that from. Pay peanuts, you get monkeys. Pay sweets, you get children. I think you boys possibly need to burn off some of that sugar. I suggest you um, go out and play outside while I then um, get some studying done and I'll myself try and find how many different Marys we have in the New Testament. Thanks. Um, so, after a lengthy study, uh, I've managed to find there are a number of Marys in the, in the New Testament. It turns out it's quite a popular name. Um, there is Mary, the mother of Jesus, obviously. Um, so that obviously isn't Mary Magdalene. You've got uh, Mary of Bethany. Uh, again, clues in the name, so it can't be Mary of Magdalene, because she's Mary of Bethany. Mary of Bethany is the sister of Martha and Lazarus, who was raised from the dead. So we know that that person is not Mary Magdalene. You also got Mary, who is the wife of Clopas. Supposedly, um, Clopas is the brother of Joseph and uh, sister-in-law of, of Mary, the mother of Jesus. She was with Mary Magdalene at the tomb. So again, we've got another Mary there. You've also got Mary, who was the mother of Mark. Um, again, uh, not Mary Magdalene. So you can see there's quite a few Marys in the Bible. And um, this may have gone towards some of the confusion regarding Mary Magdalene's background. But one thing we can say for sure is that there is no biblical evidence to suggest that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. So who was Mary Magdalene? We'll quickly have a, uh, an overview of who she was, which I think I did cover a couple of years ago when I did speak on Mary Magdalene before. Um, but for those who uh, haven't heard that or have forgotten it over the years, me included, um, let's have a just quick refresh. We've got Mary Magdalene was from the coastal town of Magdala Tarikea. Magdala means tower 
and terakea means salted fish. So what we get is Magdala terakea means town of the tower of salted fish. Um, its main business was fishing. So we don't know, um, but Mary Magdalene was a woman of means. She did support Jesus financially in his ministry and that has been documented uh, in Luke uh, 8 verses 2 to 3. Um, so it may well be that she was involved in, in the fishing industry in some way. She was a merchant of some sort. We, we don't know. We don't know. We do know that she was a woman of financial means who supported Jesus' ministry. But she was not a prostitute. And she had seven demons cast out of her. Now whether that seven is numerically how many or whether it just means that she was completely, the, the, the Semitic number of seven being a symbol of completion, whether she was completely overtaken by these demons. But Jesus healed her and she was grateful for it and followed him as a disciple and as a financial um, support to him and his ministry. That much we do know. So we have in John chapter 20, uh, Jesus raised from the dead, and this is the account of the tomb and the empty tomb. And the first person we have, while it's still dark, it says, Mary is going to the tomb. Now people have surmised over the years as to why Mary will be going to the tomb early doors on uh, on the Sunday morning, the day after, or just before the Sabbath's due to finish, because the Sabbath runs from sundown to sun up. Um, so she's just at the very cusp at the back end of uh, the Sabbath finishing and she's on her way to the tomb. Uh, it's been 36 hours since Jesus died. Uh, it's been in the tomb. Um, so people may presume she's going to anoint the body with, with oil or, or do something through the burial process. Um, but that wouldn't be kosher. You cannot touch a dead body. It would make you ceremonially unclean. So she that may not be the reason for her going to the tomb on that Sunday morning. There is a Semitic tradition that uh, after three days, um, the soul of the person departs the body. Um, that's part of the reason why some say Jesus left it three days before he went to, to Lazarus, uh, when Lazarus died, which we just mentioned earlier on. Um, because after three days, it was deemed that the person was indeed dead. You've got to remember in, in this first century um, and, and pre that, it's only in recent, recent times with uh, the modern technologies and medicine, we have a better understanding of bacteria, we have a better understanding of, of um, clinical death and brain death, etc. Um, whereas in those times they didn't. The, the way to see if somebody was dead would be to shout in their face or shout in their ear and if they didn't respond, well they're dead. So if they've just been knocked unconscious, they would suddenly come round X amount of hours later. But it was deemed after three days, if the person hadn't come round, then they were dead. Um, so that's why in the Jewish tradition and that custom at that time, you'd leave it three days before going to say your final farewell to somebody, because within that time, uh, that person could spring back to life, as it were, or regain consciousness. Um, so it could all be that Mary was going to say a final farewell because Jesus did say that he would come again. He'd rise after the third day. So again, she expected to go and say her final farewells. So what parallels can we draw? Well, there's the, the social distancing. Three days, don't treat the body. Um, can't say your, your, your goodbyes in, in the traditional way that you normally would. Um, certainly in these, these present times, um, funeral services are very much curtailed. And although that doesn't affect a lot of us, it does affect us as, as a family and as a body. Um, where one suffers, all suffer. Um, when we remember that Jesus told Mary to go and tell the news, go and tell the good news that he was alive to his disciples. Likewise, we are called to share the good news in these unprecedented times. We've got to do things differently, obviously. Um, with social distancing and um, with, with lockdown measures in place, there is 
we are curtailed to some point, but it doesn't mean we can't still share the gospel and share the good news and how we know that God is in this and share that message of hope because God is in this. God is a part of what is going on. I don't feel he's the cause of it, but he's very much in this with us. Great fear cause the disciples to hide away and withdraw from public life. And likewise, there is a lot of fear at the moment. Um, coronavirus tends to not have any mercy. Um, and I think there's a lot of fear around that and people are locking themselves away. And as such, when the disciples locked themselves away, prayer rose to the fore. It became very important. And again, something that we should be doing a lot more of now is praying praying that god's kingdom come praying for our neighbors praying for our family praying for our friends praying that we have an opportunity to share the good news that there is hope that god is in this there are a lot of people searching for answers at the moment and this is a great time to be praying for wisdom and guidance from god just as the disciples did at that time church was going to be different then after Jesus rose from the dead, after the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, church was very different. They still met at the temple, but that was more out of tradition than actually to be fed. The rise of home groups, church meeting in home, rose again to the fore. That seemed to be the place. Everything happened in a very much of a smaller place. And we're having to do church differently now. Obviously, as I'm sitting here from my study speaking to you, Church is very different. I wouldn't normally do this on a Sunday morning. And yet here we are doing church differently. And God is in this. This is something that we are called to do. So there are parallels to be drawn. Um, Mary was obviously very distressed. She suffered a lot um, losing Jesus, as she was obviously very close to, supported him financially. Um, we don't know what sort of conversations they'd have had during the time. But the fact that she was the first person there at the tomb before sunup, before the 12 disciples or 11 disciples as it would have been then, um, were that Mary was there. She was faithful and she was the first person to see the risen Jesus. That was her reward for it. And I think also as we seek God, as we cry out to God, he will meet us. He will be with us in our suffering, in our low points, in our downtime, in the time when we need him most. He will be there for us. He promises us that. He promises to never leave us nor forsake us. He is faithful when we are faithless. He gives us hope that life will not always like this. Life may never be the same again, but it will not always be like this. So take heart, church. Have hope. Seek God. Let us pray. Let us seek his will and let us share the good news and the hope that we have with our friends, our neighbours and those who we do happen to come into contact with uh, by social media means or by two metres distancing as we're going about our day. Shalom. Shalom. May the perfect peace of God be upon you all. Amen.